a project. And then any specific questions you may have for our session today, go ahead and drop underneath this section in our icebreaker. Okay, awesome. And by the way, I've just started uh, recording our session. So we're starting a little bit later today, but that's all right. We're doing a icebreaker and um, feel free to unmute your mics if you would like to ask a question at this stage. Otherwise, um, I will leave the floor to you, Michelle, whenever you feel ready to, to jump in. Fantastic. I see we've got a couple of other float folks floating in and out. Um, so we'll give it maybe two more minutes. Feel free to come in and drop in a sticky note. Um, you should be able to get in without having to log in or anything. It should just give you visitor access. Um, if it asks you to put in your email, it's just so it can correlate when you click that link again, who you are. So feel free to drop your email in. They're not going to send you marketing and other stuff. We've got lots of uh, which is exciting. Wow. Awesome. Fantastic. Some of the UI folks. That's very thrilling. Um, great. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm hoping to give you guys some time back at the end of this today as well. Um, and this link will stay live, so you're welcome to come in and reference back a lot of the content in here after we're done today. Um, so I'll post that into the chat channel as well when we're done um, in the Discord. Uh, maybe just a quick note, I like to throw some level of an agenda over on the left-hand side. so. First, let me give a quick intro. Like, who am I? Why am I talking to you today? Um, so my name is Michelle uh, Mandula Endine. I am a design strategist right now at Credera, which is a boutique consulting firm for about 3,000 people globally. Um, specifically, I work in our XD practice, so specifically focused on experience design. Um, I just finished graduate degrees at SCAD um, and also to tech, so um, lots and lots of design and kind of engineering. Uh, if you have any questions throughout our session today, please go ahead and drop them in here. Same thing, just double click on a sticky to create a sticky note and type directly into that sticky note, um, and that will create a, that question to make sure we don't lose it during any of our conversations today. So feel free to drop those questions in the parking lot as we as we go through. Um, with that. Oh, I see some other folks have jumped in. Fantastic. Um, welcome in Visiting Bear. Uh, and what we'll do is the intention for today was to focus on communication, right? So communicating like an expert and whatever expert means to you. Um, the goal here is to talk a little bit about design in terms of how do we talk about our job and our work um, what is design and some of the differences between the types of design work that we may do either on teams um, or otherwise. So with that, uh, any initial questions before we jump in? Feel free to unmute your mic so it's a little bit easier for you to communicate. Fantastic. Um, so what we'll do is I see a couple of folks up here have dropped in kind of what they do for a living, right? They're a UX or product designer. We have a UI designer. We've got a front-end developer or UX designer. Um, and that's a, where I want to start, which is how you describe your job to somebody else, right? So I'm sure we've all had the dreaded question when you end up at lunch or brunch or dinner. And kind of pause um, and maybe by show of reactions or emojis or something in the um, mural, how many people have had that instance where you're like, oh no, someone asked me what I do for a living and I have no idea how to describe that to them. 
probably quite a few of us, right? Um, we've got quite a few instances where you may say, oh no, uh, I like, I don't know, um, right? I may be a design strategist, but like, what does that mean, right? That's a bunch of like consulting words put together. It doesn't really describe specifically what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that's something that I would challenge everyone to practice on a regular basis is change the way that you continue to tell people that you do your job or what you're doing for a living because it makes it easier to figure out what makes sense to other people and what's resonating the more you talk about it. Um, but one of the challenges that we have as designers if you wouldn't necessarily call yourself a designer that design is a very big world and a lot of overlap right there was a couple folks that there because the overlap exists there's no specific the differences between those things and it may change depending in terms here too is um I found it very interesting, and there was a recent paper, this is a link out to that paper, um, but published late last year uh, that was looking at a, let's call it like an online forum, similar to a Discord, but with experts in design across all different disciplines. And they would watched the chat, they looked at the chat history for that group for 20 years, starting in 2000, and there was a ton of discourse on what design is, and what they realized and published out was that there was no resolution or agreement on a design definition within this like group serve of experts, which is intriguing and hilarious, right? Like you have hundreds of people who are qualified as leaders in the field who also can't decide what design means, which makes it make more sense that it's really hard for us to talk about. So with that, maybe let's talk a little bit about Let's see if this will just disappear. There we go. Yes. Thanks. First, in design as a verb, like I am designing something versus a noun. I, what is design as a category or a theory or principles? Um, folks have attempted to describe it in a lot of different ways, right? So you see things like the four orders of design um, in a variety of different publications that may be everything from visual communication, which is like the stuff you put on a screen in front of people, all the way out to systems or principles of thinking that all fall into the design world, right? And what we do for a living. In addition to that, like I had mentioned, there's a lot of overlap. Um, I would love if, if everyone is on the mural, you can scroll in or out on your mouse or um, swipe in or out on your touchpad to zoom in. And what I find interesting is I pulled these four graphics because all four of them are different attempts to explain the overlaps in design disciplines in the design world, right? So four different people. see is there's a ton of overlap like huge bubble and the same thing right experience design is this huge bubble um, that is connected to things like service design and product design, but this person put it super far away from user experiences specifically, or people who look at user experience. Um, when we look at things like a history of design over time, someone put together this fabulous graphic about design and how long it's been around and when that started and how we see overlap there again, right? Architecture and product and design are super old. People have been designing buildings, and designing things that people use intentionally for a very long time. We see a crop up for things like industrial design and graphic design um, back kind of in the early 1900s and then a lot of different disciplines showing up as we get closer to the 21st century. 
Um, and again, lots and lots of overlap in the kinds of work that some of those groups do or their relationships with each other. And this tree of design, I think, to me, is the most intriguing because there's a lot of things on here that I hadn't even really considered that sit in our design space, right? What do we talk about when we're looking at urban design or sustainable design for people who do lighting design for interiors? Um, lots and lots and lots of things in the design world. But again, this all makes this super duper tricky. How do you talk about your job when there may be a million different ways to talk about it and words to use to describe it? Um, that could get really confusing if it's too technical and may not be specific enough if you're too general with the people you're talking with. Any questions on any of this before I walk through kind of how we structure and think about our design and the way we communicate about design? Questions, feel free if you're... I, I recognize there's folks who may just be viewing. That's totally fine. Feel free to come off of mute and just shout at me if you've got questions. For folks who are in the mural, feel free to double click and add a sticky note anywhere that we're currently looking at. I'll see that question pop up. Okay. All right. So we've talked a little bit about the breadth of design, right? There is no centralized definition. That makes talking about it really hard. But I, what I've found is that one of the ways to be really successful when we communicate about our design work is to focus on three big things. One, that you're a storyteller, right? When you're talking about your job or about your project or about even the specific work that you did for a really, really big project, step one is establishing the context of my story, right? Like, where am I telling my story? Who am I telling my story to? And what was the situation that set me up to be where I am right now, um, thinking about the story at large, right? So are you designing for a product that's being released in Asia? Are you designing for a product that's super duper localized to Atlanta, Georgia in the United States? Um, that's really important to bring for context, right? Because there's a lot of implications for that naturally. Um, there may also be other things that we want to be thinking about in terms of context for our stories, which is who else is on the team and what kind of role did you play specifically? Were you focusing on the interactive component that someone's seeing on the mobile app? Were you focusing on the visual design system? So setting up things like the full color palette or some of the interactivity um, or even the anim motion animations and things that are going to be sitting in your space. You also want to make sure that when we're telling our stories, the best really engaged feedback is to control the pace that you're telling the story at. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I've been presenting work and talking about design work and talking to clients for 10 plus years now in work. And when I started doing presentations on a regular basis or starting to have to talk about my job or my work, I would get really stressed and my, my um, pace would speed up and I would talk really, really fast and then I would not uh, dictate really well and some of my words would blur together and it was really, really, really hard for people to follow me. We wanna control our pace for two reasons, right? One, we wanna make sure that people are understanding what we're talking about um, and the easiest way to do that is to make sure that you're talking slow enough that people can hear you enunciate everything you're saying. The second is that you want them to be able to digest what you're talking about to give you good feedback, right? Because I can go through information very quickly and may be able to have you hear and understand what I'm talking about, but I haven't built in enough time for you to process that information to be able to look at it and say, ooh, like I have a comment on that, or I want to engage in a discussion with you about something, or I have a general feedback note. Right? So all of those things are dictated by how we pace our conversations and how quickly we walk through that story. Right? Harry Potter would have by category sucked as a story if we had spent like zero time understanding how horrible the Dursleys were and had spent two minutes of the book at Hogwarts and then immediately jumped to the horrible uh, ending right? or the climax of every novel that spends five or ten chapters walking you through that. 
that wouldn't make a really good story, right? We wouldn't really care. We wouldn't really have any feelings or emotions about Harry or where he came from or his friends because we didn't spend enough time with them to be able to get bought in and then give feedback or recommend it to a friend or whatever we're doing. Finally, the last big thing that we think about, and this is normally the thing that we both do first, the good, show me the documentation. Um, and when we think about this, we may actually jump all the way to the final product, right? Like this is what the app looks like when it's done and shiny and beautiful. And a lot of the times that is the point, and that is what we want to show people and get feedback on. But the documenting of your process to get there is sometimes just as important and also can help tell your story. So you may say, hey, my first start of my story is this weird word cloud of stuff we got from our client or their first version of their website. You can show them some rough sketches, your wireframes for your second portion of your story to kind of show we are, this is how we are working through it either individually or as a team. Here's what I contributed. And then at the end, now we can see this compare and contrast between maybe how crappy the original app or website was or the experience that didn't even exist and this is what you had to do beforehand. And then, ta-da, the thing that comes out at the end after all of into that so it's out of nowhere and it feels like we have it with no context um, questions generally on like these kind of three big topics for when we're talking about design work feel free to unmute Any? if you want to shout out a question or use the text chat if you're watching Anyone else, I'll jump over to the chat for a second and give folks a minute. If you've got any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Otherwise, anyone have reflections on things that you're like, wow, I, I like, I understand I, I do a lot of the talk, fast talking and presentations, or I don't even like to present because that terrifies me. Okay, so we have one response coming. See that I see someone typing. Yeah, Koiko says that you're very clear and they like your presentation so far. Awesome. Thank you. I see someone else. I see we've got multiple people giving feedback. I love it. Tell me what like what has terrified you about presentations in the past? What do you struggle with most when you're talking about your design work today? Also, by the way, Michelle, we could um, see your share screen. You strayed away from Miro. Yep, I yeah. want. I'm gonna make sure I can capture what folks are talking about. So let me do this. I will pause yeah, share it's screen okay. for a second. I got it recording on my end. No worries. Okay, great. Uh, and I will pause for a second. We'll come back into the mural in a minute, you guys, for folks that are sitting in. Okay, so Koiko says, coming how in, to define good talk, storytelling. Talk through those before we jump into our activity. Ooh, it's a good question. So how do we define good storytelling? Um, think of your favorite book, right? Or your favorite movie even, right? Movies tell great stories. That's why we pay to go watch them at theaters maybe multiple times and then pay for subscriptions where we get to watch them at home. Um, that the key essentials that you see when you're listening to a good story or you're reading a good story are three things, right? A lot of the same stuff we've talked about today. Um, clear context and an introduction of all of our, which includes all of our characters, right? So you have to think of yourself as a character, your client is a character, or your buyer, whoever you're selling your work to. Your team is a set of characters, maybe. They may be one character, but they've probably got a lot of personalities. Um, and getting an understanding of that up front is really important, right? So first, you know, my name is Michelle. I live and I do this thing. 
do for a living. Um, I was working for my client to redesign their website or something like this right now. Um, then I'm going to build anticipation, right? This is how bad the current experience is, and this is what we were told to fix. So I have a quest that I'm going on now as a team to make this better. And then I can explain how I tackle that problem or challenge or quest or whatever I'm doing. And then that resolution and that aha moment is the moment that you may either be looking for feedback because you present the final design or you're presenting the design and you're like, we're done. We involved you throughout the process. You got to give us feedback as we are making decisions along the way. Um, but those are kind of the key components, right? We've got a starting point where we establish all of our characters and problems. We somehow reach a point where we think we can solve that problem and then that problem resolution kind of at the end of our story curve is typically your presentation or you finishing the design deliverable or you handing off the website to people. Does that make sense, Koiko? If not, feel free to throw. When you're thinking about your story, I would encourage you when you're talking about presentations with either by yourself or as a team, Make like a literal storyboard, right? The same way that you storyboard out your wireframes, storyboard your presentation because you're, you're good at storyboarding. Everyone who does design work does a lot of storyboarding. So practice that for presentations because it'll also help you say, oh, I understand where we have gaps because we set context and then we jump straight to the design deliverable. But we did no explanation of how we got there. So that's why our client is giving us the feedback they are, right? Um, so that may help you pick gaps out. Um, I see another comment on here. I tend to overthink and get distracted if I don't have a script. Yes, 100%. I do the same thing, um, right? You like have a lot of things that you're mentally managing if you don't necessarily have a script in front of you. And I think there's two ways to, to work with this. One, it's not bad to have a script, right? I think there's a lot of cases in which people are like, oh my God, a script's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. I've had business professionals that are like executives refer to note cards or have a script kind of in front of them on their PowerPoint slides while they're talking through something. And I don't think that makes them any less impactful. So if you want support note cards or a script for you to reference, write yourself a script, right? Um, the other thing that can help you uh, even if you have a script and you still get a little over, like overstressed and you can get distracted from your script is to practice a bunch, right? I know that sounds stupid and you're like, yes, everyone has told me to practice my script, but the easiest way to make sure that you follow your script is to run through it a couple of times. I, when I was doing presentations in grad school, we were typically presenting with three or four other people on my team. So we had to write a script so that we didn't run into each other verbally when we were talking about our project and it all meant that we had to practice as a team so i could practice my own section as much as i wanted but if i didn't practice it with my team doing the hand the verbal handoff or clicking through the slides at the right pace it didn't matter if i had practiced on my own right so practice in the format that you're going to kind of give that presentation and i would recommend to build in time to do that and advocate for yourself to build that time in. So you may have a project manager or a team lead who's like, we're presenting something in three days and I'll write the script and you'll get it the day before and like practice on your own and we'll present without ever going over it as a team. Feel free to push back on stuff like that. Um, sometimes it's hard, right? It's hard to push back sometimes on team leaders, but you wanna make sure that when we're doing something that warrants a presentation, right? We're, we're using everybody's time for that presentation. So it's important that we feel prepared and that we deliver as best we can to showcase our design. So think through that a little bit and feel free to, you know, send your project lead to me if they have questions about stuff like that for like why it's important to build in practice time. But you would never send a football team to a big game without a week of practice or an entire season of practice, right? It's literally the same thing. Like, it's the same thing. You would never send you to the final thing that you're, is the culmination of your skills being shown without any practice. That makes no sense. Um, 
Is that feel free to pay anything else in the chat uh, if you have follow up questions about that. Um, I see Kara asked, how do you cherry pick what parts of the presentation to speak to if everything feels important? Um, Kara, I'm going to make an assumption here and feel free to correct me in chat if it's wrong. But I'm going to assume that when you talk about that, you're talking about especially if you have a really tiny time window to present and you've got like, you know, a month or six months or a year's worth of work and you're like, oh my God, how do I, how do I figure out what's the most important? Um, my favorite way to do this is a project, right? So in my case, I've got a husband that I talk to about work every day. He's a horrible person for me to ask what's important because he's going to say everything, right? Like he's heard about all of the work. He's going to be able to, he's going to tell me everything's important, right? Yeah. Like it's not, it's not helpful. Um, but if I go to, to my parents or my sister, who I don't typically talk to about my work on a regular basis, they may get a highlight reel every month or every six months. I can ask them what they think is most important or run them through what I'm planning on telling as my script or my storyboard, and they will immediately tell me when it doesn't make sense, right? I've done that before. I've had my sister on the phone. I said, hey, can I test something with you? I have a big presentation next week, and I don't know if my story makes sense. And she said, okay, cool. Run me through it. So I gave her, you know, the high bullet point, the title of each slide, right, essentially, as I was walking through my story, and she was like, like problem statement to the first round of concepts like what did you do to make ideas happen so you got to those three ideas and I was like that's a good point I should include that right I hadn't thought that was important because I he had done it so long ago it didn't seem important like the ideation step was like whatever everyone does that but that was a great way to check and how to cherry pick that information so that what is most helpful to somebody who's never heard about it out of context will be able to give you that good feedback Hopefully that answers your question, Care, Feel free to ping in chat if you've got follow-up for that. Um, and then I see Linda asked, what I find scary when I do presentation is that I fear I will read from my presentation or stumble with my words. Um, completely like valid concern, right? That's something that I think, and all of us like we struggle with when we're doing presentations is that we don't really want to read verbatim from our slides if we can help it. Um, or from note cards and stuff. I think all of that's okay, right? Like we are, we are human. Stumbling over words happen. I've done it quite a bit today, and I've walked myself through this content a couple of times already. Um, but it happens, right? That's stumbling over words. I think is generally fine. Um, I think the only place people might yell at you about that is if you go on a TEDx in which case you have to practice a bunch to even get onto TEDx. So you get onto a TEDx, fantastic, kudos to you, send me the link, because I'll know you've practiced a bunch. Um, you made a note also about reading from your presentations. Um, I would encourage you, and all of you, is if you feel tempted to read from your presentation or from your slide or from your Miro or mural boards or however you're presenting your work, try to make sure that your presentation stuff is a lot of visuals. Right? Because that will force you to read from your script. It's not bad to have a script, right? We want to remember that it's not bad to have a script. Um, but that way, we, get, we may be tempted. If we, if we see a huge thing, worse is that our, the people we're presenting to will read it and they won't listen to you at all. Um, there's a lot of research that supports this, but if you put a lot of text on your slides, you, people you're presenting to will not listen to you talking through that slide because they're reading, right? I can't read and talk at the same time. It's really, really hard to do. Um, so, yeah, I see that. Um, you, you noted you learned that from public speaking workshops too. Make sure you're putting visuals first on your slides, and this should be easy, right? We're doing design work. This is like 90% visual, so put your visuals on there. You have compelling visuals. They, they probably look great. Even your wireframes look great to people who don't know how to do wireframing. Put them on your slide, because that means that you have something to talk to and that you can see it and say, ah, that's my wireframe. This is my wireframe section of my script. 
now I know where I am and I can get back onto my script, right? Um, so that's the way I find that it's nice to follow along with visuals for yourself so that you know where you are in your script and that helps you also practice and know where you are when you're talking about your work. Any other, I see a couple of other comments coming in, any other thoughts or questions on some of the stuff we've talked about before we do a little bit of practice? I think you mentioned a lot okay. of good pointers so far. Yeah, awesome. If, if, if anyone has any other stuff, please feel free to put it back in chat. Um, I'm actually going to reopen and reshare back into the mural, so you should see that pop up in just a second. All right, you should see the mural again, hopefully, assuming all the magic worked. Um, so now we've done a lot of talking about how to talk about design, but like I had said, and like we've got some notes in the chat, the best way to do this is to practice. And as unfortunate as that is, it means that what I'm going to ask everyone to do um, is even if you don't want to come off of mute and talk, that's totally fine. But I want to spend ev have everyone give you five dedicated minutes to think about what you next want to talk about, whether it's introducing yourself at like a career fair and your design work, whether it's the next big presentation you have, et cetera. Go ahead and spend five minutes either on a sheet of paper with yourself, on whatever else you use to note take, on the mural, kind of writing your quote unquote script for that thing. Let's try to keep it at like a minute or two minutes max to talk about it, which yes will mean you've got to pick some highlights. But give me your, uh, you know, what would you say if you're going to present about yourself or your design work or your big project you're on right now um, in a minute or two. So feel free to ping into the chat if you've got questions about how to do that. Um, if you feel super uncomfortable doing that, that's totally fine. Give yourself five minutes to go grab a cup of coffee or have lunch or get a water. Um, but feel free to go ahead and start taking notes on how to present. And then what we'll do is we'll do a quick round robin um, either to just have you talk through your notes or to have you uh, go ahead and walk us and like actually talk through your mini script. And then we'll do some feedback from other folks to practice some of the kind of critique and feedback on it. Do you need me to time for you? Pardon? Um, no, I'll go ahead and set one in here so you guys should be able to see it on here. Okay, great. So... Yeah, you should be able to see that right up here at the top. So that'll be in the mural. You've got five minutes to work, whether you want to do it in here or elsewhere. Go ahead and do that, and then um, I'll put myself on mute, and I'll turn that mute back off when we're at time. And in the meantime, I guess we could listen to some chill cow music in the background.
we've got about a minute left. Is that the All right, for the timer? folks in the Yeah, that was our timer for folks mm -hmm. in the mural. You probably just heard a note that sounded something like the put your seat belt on from your airplane. <laughs> um, it's what it's what the noise always reminds me of. Um, so, before I start, uh, is there anyone who wants to start and wants to share about um, whatever they'd like to kind of present about? Otherwise, I'm happy to get us kicked off. I see a couple of folks in the mural. Looks like we can just volunteer to, to go first. Yeah, feel okay. free to volunteer yourself. All right, yeah, I mean, hi, I'm Alexi, and I kind of have a fear of public speaking, so I kind of counteract with that by just thrusting myself in, the, in in a scenario, you know, might as well. But yeah, I kind of, I'm a, I'm a self-taught designer, but I actually also attended a boot camp a while back. And I feel like a lot of us uh, suffer like a sense of like imposter syndrome. Like we don't know enough and uh, we kind of need to learn more and more. And that's what I've been doing over time. And as a, as a, someone that is self-taught in, any profession or any job that you might want to pursue you know we scour all over the internet you know read resources like books and everything and that's what i've been doing you know i've i've compiled so much information over the span of a year and over and recently what i've been doing is it's i finally decided to put my foot down and just compile everything into one succinct repository where i can actually where i take every single note and put it down, put it down in that repository where I know that I've read it multiple times and I can recall this information. And I feel like that's how I've actually, you know, learned something in the past, like really well is that I built myself a repository of whatever I was learning. Uh, just a fancy way of saying taking notes, but yeah, that's what I've been doing so far. And, and it's, I feel like it's working pretty good. <laughs> I love it. First off, round of applause. One, thank you for volunteering to go first. Two, I found what you talked about to be incredibly clear. It sounds like you are kind of moving into the design space. Continue to learn and upskill. And to do that, you've been doing the thing that I suspect all of us do at some point in our lives, which is like taking the notes and spread them across a thousand notebooks and sticky notes and other stuff. And you're like, I'm not absorbing anything. And you've consolidated and you're like, now I'm absorbing all of the things. And I love this. This is fantastic. So very nice job. I think very, very clear communication. Other feel anyone feel free to drop other feedback comments in the chat unless you'd like to come off mute and deliver the feedback verbally, which you're welcome to do. Anyone else who'd like to volunteer to share uh, about your design work, et cetera, that you want to talk about with us today? And just make sure you got uh, your mic on, on mute so that we could hear you. Otherwise, if you'd like to type a response, you could type in the chat or on the mural board. Whatever is easiest for you. Well, 
I could I could add on to. Um, I could add on. Um, so back when I was in my boot camp, I was paired up with uh, um, a startup, and uh, right now I'm actually uh, since I graduated college last year, you know, I worked odd jobs here and there, and now I'm just like ready to transition into UX, and I'm finally putting together my uh, portfolio and like case study for this uh, startup I worked with. And I really like this project in particular because I was able to kind of go through every channel, like every part of the design process. And it really made us think critically conduct a lot of research. And um, this, this startup in particular was um, about uh, basically creating a, uh, a, uh, an app for mothers where they can connect with each other and, and kind of form a community that's like localized. And what they were using before was uh, was what WhatsApp groups, right? And so the, this was the problem and a lot. Of, and what I found the most interesting was the research part, right? Because like when, when we do um, beginner projects and, and, you know, any sort of, you know, whether it be a boot camp or something, you look up maybe like a redesign or whatever, um, you, you kind of have a hard time conducting research and you know speaking to users and this this was really good for me because you know I'm I'm a dude in, in his early 20s what do I know about motherhood you know yeah I conducted a lot of interviews with that and you know this I just wanted to share that and um, I'm just moving along I love it that is really exciting. I agree. I love research. I'm biased. I'm a design researcher and strat. I find it's very compelling to your point. Um, that made a really good thing to call out in your portfolio. One, really good research is really hard to do. So the fact that you got to conduct research at all is very exciting, um, especially firsthand. Uh, and second, if you have a portfolio link or stuff that you want me to look through, for your storytelling or want to do practice, feel free to drop your link in the mural or ping it to me privately on the Discord and I'm happy to look at it. That goes for anyone else as well who's on the call. Um, if you've got stuff you want me to look through, you want to do practice for things that you're presenting, etc., and you need an unbiased third party, that's me. Feel free to feel free to send me a DM in Discord. Anyone else who wants to share, let me quick see if we've got anything. I've got a couple of folks saying writing improves your memory. Yes. Um, anyone else who wants to share otherwise, I will go through my last couple of things to just close us out and we'll do final. Okay. Um, I guess I just had a question. Yeah. Um, so for me, because uh, I am a career transitioner, the, the thing that really I get hung up on is the terminology for a lot of things because I did product design, but it was more like physical product design. Mm -hmm. And in my research about transitioning, I, um, I, I gathered like that it's good to reframe some of your past experience into more of a UX oriented um, storytelling presentation. The only thing is that I feel like I have a hard time sometimes correlating between my previous experience into UX because a lot of the terminology isn't the same. And I feel I keep tripping on my own words because I, I feel like there's probably better terms that I, instead of me fleshing out an entire like paragraph of speech, trying to explain how something is related to the other thing without using buzzwords. I feel like I'm just, at some point I either just use buzzwords or just like throw it, throw it against the wall or <laughs> all of them. And then are, am I explaining something in a very like rudimentary way? I think that's it's, for some odd reason, there's only one extreme or the other at this point that I'm trying to break. Hi, it's a great question, which I think, let me, let me reframe your question just a smidge and then let me know if that's still accurate for your question. Um, how do you find the balance between buzzwords and not buzzwords uh, to accurately describe your work and or re-describe your work in a context that's unfamiliar to you? Like, transitioning it over to UI or UX verbiage. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Summary of your question? Okay. Yeah, pretty um, much. Two very good questions. Well, let me address them actually a little bit separately. So your second question, I will actually tackle first, which is how do I talk about my work in a way that is relevant to my audience, which is essentially what you're asking, right? Like how do I talk about my product work 
in a way that makes sense to people who are UX designers? It's, it's an age old question, and I, I think the way that you're approaching it is the best way to do that, right? Which is looking at the way that UX folks attack and talk about their work, and then trying to do a little bit of a one to one. What I would encourage you to think about, though, is that while product is very similar in a lot of ways to UX, there are things that stand out and make product different, especially for physical product build, right? Um, and doing that in person and, you know, helping to design stuff that has like production and manufacturing constraints, which you have a little bit of with stuff like uh, mobile and web design. You may have constraints on the, the tool systems and code bases you're using, but generally the constraints are very different in terms of communicating about them. Um, so I think doing a little bit of the translation over is helpful, and I would lean into and acknowledge the fact that you have a product background, especially if you've spent a lot of time in product. Your expertise are, is valuable there, and people are going to find that about expertise valuable because you can speak both languages. Um, so process, the research may have a lot of things in common for language, right? But phases that have stuff that's less in common, like maybe the production or manufacturing phase, um, or the you know mockups, prototypes, wireframing, et cetera, you feel free to use those words interchangeably or say something to the effect of, you know, doing this kind of work using your product language, right? Like doing the manufacturing feasibility testing, which is very similar to us doing you know, initial prototype testing or wireframe testing with users in UX and give them a comparison so that they recognize that it's not the exact same thing, but they, there may be something very similar about it in the way that they're working. And that way you can still use language that makes you really comfortable and that you're used to and push yourself to how to orient that to the UX world. Does that help answer that question? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I didn't really see the angle of like still using the right terminology, but shifting it so that they also understand there's similar, it's not exactly the same. Yeah, and it may be, and to answer a little bit of your second question now, it may be helpful up front to frame it that way, right? And say, I'm going to talk to you, especially if you're doing something like a portfolio showcase or a project showcase, you can say, I'm going to talk about this project, um, and here's the general pro before I take you through it, here's the general process we took that I will take you through today. And, you know, below that, you see the UX process and how similar they are. And that way, up front, you're even orienting them to the fact that you're going to be using both sets of language, which is a really, really good skill set, one, for orientation, but two, for them to understand that you can, you can think in both which is, is like crazy and a really good skill, right? It's like being able to speak two different languages literally um, just in the working world. Hopefully that answers your question and or is helpful. <laughs> um, and out stuff. Um, let me do this then real quick. Let me slide over and kind of talk quickly about some resources and stuff. Um, I don't see anything in our parking lot. I will stop sharing my screen in a minute and we'll do the last round of Q&A in the Discord to make it easier for folks to see that. Um, feel free to either put it on here on a sticky note somewhere on this scale. Um, just double click, drop a sticky there and um, you know, drag it to where you want it or type in the number for if you'd recommend this to other folks. Same thing in the chat, feel free to do that. It just helps me gauge whether or not this was good and useful to you guys. Um, feel free to also drop feedback into the chat. Love, love feedback, All, always open to feedback. So feel free to drop any of that or send it to me in a private DM. If you're like, I don't wanna put that in the chat channel, that's fine, just DM me um, with feedback on the webinar. Any uh, quick couple of resources, I also have some other good resources I can share with you guys about stories and stuff. I'll drop those in the general chat channel on the Discord for everyone to be able to see if they didn't come today, but some good resources on storyboarding. I know we talked a little bit about storyboarding, but this is a great template to kind of have you mentally walk through what are your like beats in your story. 
Um, and I don't know how many other people use stuff like a Kanban in their day-to-day -day basis, but this is what I've started using to help keep track of all the things and projects and stuff that I'm working on or stages for those projects. So this is, this is a great way to kind of keep track of, of your work um, to help reduce some of the mental clutter to let you focus on things like storyboarding or your presentations. Um, any other questions on anything in the mural before I stop sharing my screen and then I can answer the last bit of Q&A just over audio in the Discord? All right, hearing nobody freaking out over audio, let me do this. I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Um, if you've got other questions or want to stay on for a second, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, happy to happy to discuss, do feedback, et cetera. Um, let's see, I see someone dropped a couple of good resources about a US X glossary. Fantastic. We love to see that. Um, I see a note here, someone doesn't think their mic is working. I'm sorry, I've had that problem. Um, similar experience with explaining products, what products actually do, um, especially if it's B2B. Yeah, it's it's a challenge sometimes to translate that over. Um, I think it's a matter of, you know, doing some of that one-to-one -one and showing them both sets of language or talking in both sets of language. The other thing that may be helpful is having someone in the UX space specifically, if that's what you're trying to transition to, look at it and hear you go through it with them um, and give feedback because they may be able to pick out things where they're like, ooh, but this is also like wireframing, right? And you maybe didn't make that connection yet. Um, so it may be good for them to also give you some, some industry specific feedback before you go present to like a hiring manager. <laughs> Any other questions, feel free to drop them into the chat. Yeah, it was a great presentation. Thank you for doing that. Um, I'm not sure if this was mentioned before in your talk, but when it comes to speaking with stakeholders versus other designers, do you have any recommendations for how to um, curtail your speech to your audience, especially if they're stakeholders and they don't have UX experience? Oh, it's a really good question. And it actually reminds me a lot of the couple of the other questions we've had around like, I'm from product, how do I talk about UX or talk to UX people in a way that makes sense, right? It's just the inverse. You're in the UX shoes and you're talking to people who have no UX context or experience. I do this literally every day. I'm working with healthcare clients right now and they like, have zero understanding about how any of the stuff that we're talking about works. Um, so my first suggestion would be very similar to the other side of the conversation, which is getting an understanding of the language that they do use and that they're comfortable with, and then working uh, with that language and showing them a one-to-one, -one, right? So don't use only UX language and don't use only their language because neither of them are really 100% accurate, <laughs> right? Um, your, the UX language may be super accurate to what you're doing, but they don't understand it. And the language they may use doesn't really describe what you're doing in UX. So use both where you can, right? Especially in emails and in other kind of like written communication. They may ask for something like, hey, can you show me like how someone would go through this thing? And they may refer to it as something else. And you're like, oh, a user flow. What they're looking for is a user flow or a workflow um, or a wireframe and use that language to describe that work to them, but also use the language that they use when they ask you for it, because that'll make sure that they mentally start to connect. And then and the next time they, they may use the word user flow. It may still be a little incorrect, but we have to teach them along the way about what we do mm -hmm. as opposed to expect them to know how to ask for what we do. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's your question? A, yeah, it totally makes sense. That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, I also have a question yeah. about articulating uh, the value of the, the work that you do, because obviously, yes, we have to explain our process and why we do things. But when it comes to communicating clearly with stakeholders, they also want to know about results. Um, so what are your kind of tips on how to frame things in a way that keeps the stakeholders like engaged and they feel as though you are understanding their needs as well as um, you know 
vouching for the, the user and making sure that their needs are also not being left behind? Oh, it's a, such a good question, right? It's the classic, like, does the business care about the person that they're designing for? Or do they care about the business? Yeah. Um, we would like to believe they care about both. Um, sometimes that may be less obvious in the way they talk about it, right? Generally, I'd like to think that people care about both. I also am an optimist, so take that take that with a grain of salt. Um, I would say, and it generally, um, it is very helpful to involve people in getting bought into research and or user personas or interviews or outputs of those things like archetypes, your journey maps, etc. Because to your point, they may have stuff where they're like, I need more clicks on the website. I need more conversions in this pipeline, whatever. That's all fine. And those are great business like results that we want to be achieving. But we have to translate that also to like, why is that not happening from a consumer perspective or from my customer perspective or my people perspective? So having them understand that they're not getting click throughs because the website text is really confusing is a great way to get them bought in on like, we need to make the website text more clear so that I can get more click throughs. You're not the one conducting the research, the back and forth with, to say a problem that you gave us from the business. We're connecting it with why that problem is happening from the user. And then I am solving the user problem that will then fix the business problem, right? So kind of helping them draw that line because they're probably going to just skip to the user or the reason why the business is having an issue as opposed to looking at the actual user problem driving the business problem. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we also have another question from Aria and they say, do you have any tips for presenting in a non-ideal environment? For instance, when having bad Wi-Fi connection or while feeling very stressed from unrelated things? Oh, it's such a good question. Um, I like, I live this literally every day um, because one, I have generally crap Wi-Fi. I don't know if it's been bad today, but I generally have poor Wi-Fi. I also have eyes that get super tired from spending time on a screen. So you can imagine that like, doing long days for work on a computer is like not generally good to have me at peak performance for presenting. Um, I would recommend get like the same way that you probably have some level of a self care, a self care routine for other things. Give yourself a pre presentation self care routine or a checklist, right? My, on mine personally is make sure my life but it's not. I, I had to stuff for travel, so I apologize that my lighting has been crap. But generally, when I see that my lighting is like better on my actual screen for video and stuff, I feel more calm and prepared, even if the presentation is going to be a nightmare with whoever we're talking with, etc. Um, when you have things like right bad Wi-Fi, um, give yourself an option and a backup. And don't feel bad about asking for those things, right? We live in 2022 now. People have gone through two plus years of working entirely remotely in a lot of cases and had to like come up with workarounds. There are workarounds available, which means that if you're like, I know my Wi-Fi is unreliable or I know I'm going to be traveling, my Wi-Fi is not going to be great. What are your options? And talk with your team about that. If you're presenting with a team, talk with your client about that. If you're presenting with a team, work with your team to say, do I need to be on video? because I know that's going to make my Wi-Fi worse, right? Um, or can we not have me on video? Can someone else cover my portion of the presentation if my Wi-Fi is really bad and it drops, right? So that I don't fumble around and get stressed that we're going to delay and like lose the presentation. Um, so come up with some alternatives. I also really like, and one of the things that I've petitioned for a lot at my work is to have a dial-in option, right? Because my Wi-Fi may be really bad, but my cell connection is great most of the time. So there's a lot of times where I will dial in my audio for a call and leave my video up with no audio for my dial in for the presentation so that they can see me talking, but my audio is actually coming from my phone to make sure it doesn't drop part of the way through. And that way I know I can continue to talk through stuff even if my Wi-Fi drops. Um, so give yourself some options, build a lot of highlights
know that there's a back. Sometimes stuff fails, it's fine. Um, for things like when you're stressed, go through some of the stuff that you like to do for self-care. Otherwise, try to build in buffers before presentations. Like don't jump from one call into a presentation because it means that you don't have any like mental decompression or prep time. So try to block out like the 15, 30 minutes on your calendar before a big presentation if you can do that to just get in the right mental space, get a bathroom break, get a glass of water, whatever else you need. Um, but trying to set yourself up for success like physically is really important for that. Um, I see if that didn't answer your question, Aria, feel free to ping additional stuff into the chat. Um, Care, I see a question from you. When going through a presentation, I've heard that you should articulate your impact on the team project. How can you smoothly do that, excuse me, when presenting? An example would be helpful. Um, you should articulate your impact on the team project um, when you are presenting about your work specifically. Um, I've, I have a lot of feelings on this, so I'm going to try Right, they're not going to highlight your whole design team for the project. So, so you do want a team at work and presenting out to your client. Don't talk about specifically what you did because the client doesn't care generally, right? Like they don't care what Aria versus Care did. They care about the product or the work that's getting generated. So that's all that really matters to them. Who did the work is kind of a non-starter. Your boss may care internally about who did the work because who did the work may not have been who should have done the work. So that's a different discussion to have with them. Um, but when you're presenting to a client, I wouldn't actually articulate like your impact versus the team's impact. But if you're in an interview, it's all about you. Make it all about you. It is not the time to be humble in an interview. Um, when you, how do you do that well, right? Without sounding like a jerk. Um, one, people recognize that like that is uncomfortable. Most people feel uncomfortable talking about themselves and their work. So it's okay to have that be a little uncomfortable for you. Totally fine. Um, my exa an example of ways to do that smoothly is put stuff specifically that you have done for different project phases in your portfolio or the, in whatever you're using to showcase your work, right? So you can have the final thing that might have been the final app or the final Figma like prototype walkthrough, et cetera, but make sure to give yourself call out for work that you specifically delivered, right? So normally, maybe your Figma prototype normally doesn't include like the color palette and the rest of the design system that you built. Make sure to include that because that's something that you can talk to because you might have had teammates who then like built out all the interactivity and stuff and that's fine. But you can say, hey, I did a lot of the research and I built out the like color system. I built out the design system. I built out the look and feel of a lot of this and here's the ways that I did that. So they'll want to see the end result, the shiny end result. Everyone always does. But spend most of your time, like if you have five minutes or 10 minutes to talk about your project, spend eight of those talking about what you did on the project and then contextualize that to the project at large, right? Because they don't care about what all your other team delivered. They care about what you delivered. If that doesn't answer your question, Care, feel free to drop something in chat. Happy to dive into that more if you have more questions on it. No, that's fine. I just, because sometimes when I'm doing like a group project or that I've done in the past, I feel like a lot of it's been to move the story along about the project. A lot of it is um, collaborative. Um, sometimes, so sometimes I can't, don't really recognize when I specifically spearheaded something because I feel like, at least in this part of my career, like I feel like everything is collaborative. Like I might say, I might suggest something, but everyone works on it together. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure oh, if most people, it, in the dynamics of things, if people actually do, you know, like spearhead something and, and take ownership of something to speak to. It's a, it's a great point, and maybe my quick follow-up on that for you would be that that is happening a lot, right? Like, I had that happen all the time in grad school where we had a collaborative project, and you're like, who did what? No one knows. We all, like, were on group calls brainstorming together, et cetera. Um, if you have areas where you recognize you're like, I can't really discreetly pull out, like, what I did on that project, 
my way to get around that is I've started doing this at work every week, like every Friday afternoon with like a glass of wine or something else. I would write out a list of what I did that week, like literally the kind of work I did that week. And then I could say, ooh, this week I was project manager. Like I made a lot of the timing decisions. I scheduled a lot of our team meetings. I made sure that people had deliverables in. So like I participated in all of our group calls, but I also worked as a project manager. Exactly. You don't have to do it as a weekly, I see the chat as a weekly stand up. You don't even have to do it with other people. You can do it as yourself, right? And say like my weekly time, I block out 30 minutes. I sat in front of a computer fixed on the job that you you had and like write yourself like title for the week. So that one week it might be, you know, interaction designer because I'm designing that component of our prototype. One week it might be researcher because I led my own sets of interviews, right, without other people. Um, so those are super duper helpful to do. Uh, and if you realize that you're doing a lot of the same roles or you're having a trouble answering that question, ask your team to take ownership of something. So like, like I want to own the research bit for this. And that can mean that you write the questions. That can mean that you get to go over all the data, that whatever that means for the team. But if you're having trouble in your weekly like retrospectives or stand-ups with yourself, writing what you did for work, ask your team to let you take ownership of something so that you can write something on your list at the end of the week, right? Like be a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> Hopefully that answers your question. Any other final questions? I know we're over time. Thank you for folks who have stayed with us. Um, any other final kind of questions or things that I can help you with? All right. If nothing, I, I live in the Discord now, um, so I'm here. If you've got questions, just shoot me a ping. Uh, I'm, I'm only a ping away constantly. Um, so feel free to let me know if you need stuff. I'm happy to do, I'm like, I'm happy to be the person that you do your presentation practice with or you send your storyboard to for feedback. Please feel free to use me for that. Um, and if there's anything else more specific that you want feedback on or you've got stuff to practice, especially for things like interviews for presentations, if you've never done like prototype showcasing and stuff before for interviews, shoot me a DM, ping me, let's set up some time. Uh, by the way, do you have a link to your LinkedIn that you want to share with the rest of the Being team? Around. I appreciate it. I know it is. Yep, I can drop that. Give me one second. All right, there you guys go. Feel free to shoot me a connection on LinkedIn um, and let me know if you guys need anything. We're also like shameless plug. We are hiring our, in our XD team at Cordera. Like we desperately need people. We are so, we have so much, so much work coming in for clients. If you're looking to get into XD, whether that's in front end development, content strategy, doing the visual design work, doing the copywriting, we have copywriting teams. Uh, shoot me a DM. Let's talk about it um, because we've got Ooh. lots and lots of spots open. Yeah, by the way, I might chase you up on that. I, I'm kind of curious, though. Do you want to post that job in our uh, job posting channel? <laughs> I can do that. We have a lot of posting. So maybe what I'll do is I will post it. link to Cradera in our job. So I will post those generally, but if people have questions, follow up with me and I can direct you guys to the right design people. All right, that sounds awesome. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you very much, everyone else who decided to participate. I learned a lot, you all learned a lot, and I'm glad you're here to make that happen. Um, last thing is, uh, don't forget that we have some more events coming up for next week. So definitely check out uh, how to present your work with uh, WeM as well as Valerie Kenya. She's going to be talking about game UX. So if you guys are interested in, you know, how to improve your portfolio or how to work in the gaming industry as a UX designer or a researcher, uh, definitely just scroll up to the top 
and uh, register your interest and you'll get a, a reminder for those things. And yeah, that's it. That kind of concludes this talk. This whole session has been recorded. So don't worry if you missed it, we will definitely edit it and uh, upload it to our YouTube channel. If you don't know where our YouTube channel is, there's a link on our About channel. So just click there and we'll link it to uh, YouTube. Thank you so much, guys, and uh, have a great weekend. Yeah, it's the weekend. It's Friday. All right, <laughs> see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.